If there was one word for Water 7, I think it would be compact. And I could have totally seen it just be one individual storyline taking up the entire arc. But instead, Water 7 feels like a cobweb of storylines. We have Frankie interacting with a going Mary that connects to Usopp and the Straw Hats and Mr. Tom, Pluton, etc, etc. You get the idea. And you have this interconnected spider web, which could have totally been a disaster. But what makes it work is that this spider web doesn't just create like new storylines. It connects them together. We're not just learning about Mr. Tom to learn about Iceberg to learn about like Iceberg's dog who like has fleas. <laughs> Instead, the story just throws a crazy idea out there and then spends the next 10 or 20 chapters trying to justify how in the world that connects to the rest of the story. So instead of just rambling, all of these elements help reinforce other storylines, which in turn help reinforce this storyline. And to me, that's what makes Water 7 work. So I think we should just like skip all the broad stuff and dive straight into the interesting stuff of Water 7. I think the Going Mary and what the Going Mary symbolizes is kind of like the heart of the Water 7 arc especially with how it's going to connect with everything else in this arc. It's interesting that for over 200 chapters now, we have seen the Going Mary travel through East Blue, just getting absolutely destroyed wherever it goes. And it has been repaired every single time just off of the edge of collapse, which creates this little bit of hope that maybe the Going Mary will get repaired. Which is kind of where we get the first branching storyline as the gold gets lost and all of a sudden the whole point of this arc comes into question of whether we can even repair the going mary even after the crew does everything they can to try and get their gold back they still can't and they choose to be optimistic about it and eventually even though it hurts abandon the ship and like honestly it's painful. After like seeing the crew get the ship and go on all of these adventures after over 200 chapters finally being told that the Going Mary cannot go any further is heartbreaking. But because everyone's in this sort of denial phase, I could totally see someone like Luffy being like, no, just putting their foot down, we're gonna keep the Going Mary. We've seen them do that with all of their crew members. Because at this point, it's not that much of a stretch to call the Going Mary its own character. We have seen explicit emotions from the Going Mary just based off of like the weather or the lighting in a shot, just emphasized by like the head of the ram on the prow of the ship. But I think it hits so much harder that out of everybody who wants to keep the ship, the person who decides to plant their feet on the ground is Usopp. Usopp has like a fundamental connection to the Going Mary, as it ties into the introduction of Usopp in Surf Village, as we learn about Mary and Kaya, and we know Usopp's connection to the Going Mary and how it relates to everyone that we've known from Surf Village. For me, that's what makes this so much stronger. On the one side, we have all of this history with the Going Mary, and on the other side, we're able to see how the Going Mary connects to Usopp's inner turmoil with them constantly doubting their self-worth. Like, Usopp knows this. They have their moments, but they have been like the weakest link in the chain, just strength-wise. So to see the Going Mary literally have a make-it-or-break-it moment, finally reaching its end here in Water 7, can start to put pressure on Usopp. And because of that, the backlash that Usopp gives feels understandable. We see Luffy try to comfort Usopp at their lowest by pivoting over into an optimistic position, showcasing that, oh, you know, we can't fix the going merry, but we can maybe get another ship. Usopp in turn goes from being sad, being confused, to questioning Luffy's position of power, to Luffy then becoming more assertive, stating their ground as captain, as things naturally but very quickly start to get very intense. From a narrative perspective, I love that it's one of these situations where like nobody wants this to happen. At some point, they're getting so aggressive and saying so many things to each other that Sanji has to step in. For as much as we're highlighting these two characters in a conflict, we're also really highlighting the rest of the crew in their reaction to this main conflict. Even knowing Usopp at the end was not going to be convinced. Usopp 
fully knew the consequences. They knew that they were not going to win. And it's interesting that Luffy was fully aware of that exact same scenario, but also knew that they were unable to talk Usopp down and accepted the challenge because of that. Usopp knew what he was getting into, and Luffy does too. For as much as they have like some very jokey moments and like joke about their intelligence, this is like a very emotionally intelligent scene from both of these characters. So when they do eventually fight, we see all of the crew react to it, especially Zoro. I want to highlight Zoro here because Zoro acts very differently than the rest. Everyone else is sort of either crying or distressed or worried. Zoro is keenly aware not only of what's going to happen during the conflict, but also what's going to happen after the conflict. So we get right into the Usopp versus Luffy fight, and I wasn't expecting Usopp to go anywhere with this. At the start of the fight, we see Usopp pulling a trick that has never worked. And it starts proning you to think like, oh, is this how the fight's gonna go down? Is Usopp just gonna have nothing in his sleeves? And we see Usopp possibly at their strongest doing a full 180 when they use all of the tricks that we've seen them use the entire time in a very serious and strategical manner. Like previously, if you pit these characters against each other, there would have been no hope in Usopp. But to now see Usopp manage to clutch up and handle himself so well against Luffy. Really showcasing just all of the things Usopp is now capable of when they're like at their peak. But the thing is, no matter who gets a hit in, no matter who does what, you don't want it to happen. This is like a lose-lose scenario no matter what goes down. Even when Luffy manages to win... Nobody's happy about this. This is not like the other fights. This is not a pinnacle victory. This isn't even like an I told you so. This is the crew at their lowest. All that you can take away from this fight is the shame and doubt that came from it. As we see Luffy, for one of like the first few times, doubting their actual role as captain with Zoro again being very strong-willed, knowing what would already happen, telling him like, hey, this is what it means to be captain. Telling him to suck it up because the crew is still trying to believe in him. And it is intense. I had to like stop and go outside and take a breather every single chapter because things got very emotional. I love that Chopper is told not to help Usopp because this is like what Usopp wanted and it would be very shameful to go and help him at this time. But even after all that, it doesn't matter to Chopper. They still go over there and help Usopp because they're a doctor first and foremost. That's why they're here. It's a very small moment, but it establishes a lot of agency to Chopper that we don't really get to see. This is also around the same time where I mentioned that the Going Merry feels like a character within themselves. Throughout the entire Usopp versus Luffy fight, we see the rain falling onto the Going Merry, very poetically creating what appears to be like tears streaming down the Going Merry's face as they are a passive observer, incapable of stopping this. And after the fight, we just see Usopp laying there as we get very still shots of the Going Merry, further emphasizing the emptiness that is felt after the crew has departed. And honestly, if that was the entire story of Water 7, it could have easily, by itself, been its own arc. But I think what elevates the storyline is the fact that it's tied to everything else. So let's use it as a jumping off point to talk about Frankie. So Frankie at the start is just a villain whose purpose is essentially setting up the conflict for the entire Going Merry Usopp plotline. And honestly, at the start, it did such a good job making me hate Frankie, uh, in part because of all of this, like, previous connection that we had to the Going Merry. So even if we learn that, like, the Going Merry is irreparable uh, later on in the story, it's a very bold move to create a villain, which then we're gonna try to make likable later on. When that villain is going against the boat, practically this character that we've been through for like over 200 chapters. And while at the end, the Going Merry wasn't repairable, Frankie was still that last straw that created a little bit of extra conflict 
that could have been responsible for further breaking up the crew. So by stealing all of the gold, we are directly creating a link back to the Straw Hats while also connecting it to the Going Merry. And so first I'm thinking, okay, Frankie's just being set up to be the bad guy. They're even like going out of their way to find Usopp as a way to lure in the Straw Hats, you know, without really knowing that they split up. And it is at this point, from a narrative perspective, where they very delicately shift over Frankie from this like bad villain over into like a more charming, likable character. And it was all when Frankie learned about Usopp's backstory. Like the pivot shift was strong. Frankie started crying, I mean sweating, sweating out of their eyes. We saw Frankie throw out some jokes, but still be extremely sympathetic towards Usopp and the Going Merry, even going so far as to help Usopp scrap the Going Merry. He was fully willing to let Usopp do whatever they wanted with the ship until they realized that Usopp was just gonna get themselves killed and stepped in and actually helped them try to get some clarity in the situation. Not just empathizing with Usopp, but even saying, think of the ship, think about what the ship would feel like if it went out of its way to carry you all the way over here on its last two legs and then you decide to just board it out and just crash and burn in the sea. This is like the turning point for Frankie. When they learned about the Going Merry situation and when they learned that like the Frankie house has been destroyed, they're like, okay, water under the bridge. They're like, I robbed from you, you destroyed my thing. It's okay. It's also really interesting that we see elements of Skypea. We see like the ghost builder upon the ghost ship. Apparently, it's a real folklore legend thing that happens. And it's amazing introducing that element here, like repairing itself, almost being aware that this is as far as it'll go. Also, I feel like I just skipped over this, but like Frankie is a robot. Nobody, we're not, we're just not going to talk about that part. Like, I guess there's not much to say on it, but after like 300 chapters, this is like the first time we learn about cyborgs. The closest thing to this was like Hand Axe Morgan, and I don't know if they count. In all honesty, it's not that big of an issue, but it just came out of nowhere. Sadly, all of this moment got cut off when like CB9 showed up and just like dumped the going Mary out into the ocean, which feels like it shouldn't be the end, right? Like it feels like there should be some more closure to the going Mary. But at the same time, how utterly depressing is it to end on a low note for a going Mary? Having like the ship just nonchalantly just fall back into the ocean, being like the nail in the coffin as like the low point, the like lowest of points for the Straw Hats, which probably makes a good transition over into the shipbuilders and CP9. So CP9 is like what? Part-time secret government agent, part-time shipbuilders? I like the fact that like, despite everything that they've done, they're still really good shipbuilders. Like I like that throughout the story, they consistently connect back to the Going Merry. For as much as we are CP9, we are still shipbuilders and we still know that yeah, the Going Merry cannot be fixed. Like multiple characters stated this, just if it wasn't any clearer that we're not a red herring or anything. And even though it's a mystery and we're setting up like, oh, who could CP9 be? I like that we still get a bunch of hints towards the shipbuilders. We see Iceberg Secretary just start pulling out kicks for no reason. And we get a lot of the shipbuilders fighting. We get like the Usopp clone, like Usopp but better, doing an insane amount of parkour. And while it's established that, oh yeah, all of the shipbuilders are just built different here on this island, it kind of obfuscates that these shipbuilders are CP9 just because it like better allows them to hide their strength within this group of shipbuilders. But they are way stronger, not because of like a fruit ability, though they do have like a fruit ability, but not because of the fruit ability, but just naturally training to be stronger. Because it shows that there wasn't like a weakness to overcome, like Crocodile in the desert where you just had to figure out the gimmick, but rather, this is just natural strength. It would make sense for CP9 to be a part of the shipbuilders to be really close to Iceberg, because it makes sense that the secret government agency would want to keep tabs of Iceberg, because we learned that Iceberg has the blueprints for Pluton. I love that like a third of the way into the story, there is an entire mood shift. We have gone from like an adventure story to like a sad drama to a mystery story 
revolving the disappearance of Robin. Like what happened? What are the people wearing the masks doing? And how do they connect to Robin? Like how do they know her? Not only do we have like Robin's disappearance, but it's also when we learn about the fact that Iceberg's been shot and all of a sudden there is this question of whether or not Robin was fully responsible for this. And at first I was like, oh, Robin wouldn't use a gun. We've seen how she operates. And then nope, plot twist, she can and will use a gun. And it puts the entire crew in a defensive position. Luffy, Zoro, and Nami have to really think about whether Robin is an ally or not because they just don't know here. Zoro again takes the step forward and says, hey, I, I don't want to say it. I'm going to be neutral about it. But we have to really start thinking about whether they're our enemy or not. Sanji later on spots them heading towards the train and we see Sanji going like full suave detective analyzing why Robin would act this way. By the way, can I just say I really love this side of Sanji? Seeing Sanji just like deduce what is happening, like, oh, she could easily take everyone down here. Why isn't she doing that? Is someone like forcing her to do this? And if so, why? We see like the cogs turning so well here while still maintaining like classic Sanji character. We know that like Robin's been interested in the big cubes and Robin uh, before was with Crocodile learning about Pluton. And so it also reintroduces some doubt. What is she going to do with this thing? So Robin's storyline has a strong connection to the shipbuilders and CP9 while also having a strong connection directly to Iceberg and Pluton. And we learn that she's doing this in order to save the Straw Hats from a terrible fate indirectly connecting it to the themes of the going merry while the crew has been falling apart. And we learn about this terrible fate connecting like Robin and Aokiji, which gives us like a glimpse into like what Aokiji is capable of, not only with like the freezing ability, which was already like pretty strong within itself, the ability to just freeze a giant portion of the ocean. But now we see that Aokiji had the ability to like order a buster call, which was like what the ability to essentially use infinite resources to destroy a target. It's like, yeah, no wonder Robin would be a part of whatever is going to happen. The alternative is that. So I feel like we can't even talk about Iceberg and Pluton without diving into the history of Water 7. Because again, due to the spiderweb, everything connects. Despite the pretty aesthetic of Water 7, it is still a city in ruins. One of the things that I started to realize is that like some people just live outside of the Grand Line and that's how they live their everyday life. I'm talking about like Syrup Village, you know, like those kind of people. And then others don't go to the Grand Line for adventure. They just live there. Like Frankie and Iceberg and everyone in Water 7 and Alabasta, like they're not trying to compete to be like the king of the pirates or anything. They just like live in, in the Grand Line and that's their life. And so for like regular everyday people that just live in the middle of the Grand Line, it's like, yeah, transportation would be a big issue. And I think what really just puts it all together is the fact that like Water 7 a few years ago was just like the struggling island which really just needed resources. And so we learned that like Mr. Tom and their entire crew was responsible for building the Puffing Tom, the like sea train. But of course that's not really the full story. There are just like a bunch of people who had like scraps and spare parts and destroyed ships and this is what you could do with those circumstances. It wasn't a story about like a shipbuilding crew who knew exactly what they were going to do to fix this problem on the Grand Line. It was just like a person who saw what could be and tried their best to fulfill it. And sure, Water 7 wasn't just magically fixed. There were still a lot of problems with a lot of people doubting how they were even going to get out of the situation, even with the Puffing Tom being built. And it's amazing to see Mr. Tom reply by saying, like, we are resilient creatures. Like, the world could be bad, and as dire as it looks, we'll manage. So Mr. Tom was just a character who was always running out of time. They were going to be executed by the world government for not even being a part of, but just, like, building Gold Roger's ship for what the world government said, being responsible for this whole new wave of piracy. 
And Mr. Tom is a pretty strong character in this arc. And it's reflective in like when Frankie builds their version of like the battle Frankies, which are then used against them and everything goes sour. Mr. Tom doesn't like critique Frankie for anything that happened there, but rather tell Frankie to be proud of the things he's made. Iceberg, who used to work with Mr. Tom and Frankie, both of which were extremely against the world government, to the point where it became like a problem problem, somehow managed to turn things around, make themselves mayor, bring Water 7 to the point where it is right now, and it's surprising that any of that managed to happen while Iceberg must have been very paranoid. I think this is where we can start to see the Iceberg story thread connect to the shipbuilders and Frankie. Now that we know how like CP9 plays into Mr. Tom's storyline, for me it totally clicked why Frankie and Iceberg looked so different to the point where I didn't even think they were connected at first. Because that felt so off to me, and yet that was the entire point. They were like so purposefully trying to be as different as possible. Iceberg with like the documents for Pluton gave them to Frankie because Iceberg knows out of anyone who would give their documents over to the world government, it would not be Frankie. Iceberg is like playing 4D chess and in the end, he's correct. But the shipbuilders turned CP9 were going to backstab him. They like broke in, they used like the help of Robin. They almost just took out Iceberg and even found his fake documents. Which by the way, can I just say, Iceberg, buddy, you, you were doing so good. One minor complaint. Did you really have to say that those documents were fake? I don't, th I don't think you needed to address the fact that they were fake. Like imagine what would have happened if like CP9 went back to their base with the documents for Pluton and then looked at them and realized like, wait a minute, these aren't the real documents. Like that would have been a 5D chess move. You can't just go out and admit that your fake plans are fake. Why would you then make fake plans if you're gonna say that they're fake? I love that the worst things seem to get, the more optimistic the crew got. It's like everyone's hunting them down. Let's go get Robin. We almost just died. Turns out Robin didn't betray us. The Aqua Laguna is coming to destroy everything? Oh, it's a perfect time to get your hopes up and get Robin. Nami sees that like Zoro and Luffy are just stuck in a building and she's like, come on, quit messing around. Now is not the time. Let's go get Robin back. And so literally under the worst of circumstances, at the like peak of the most dangerous time of Aqua Laguna, when like the tide's at its highest, now is when the crew's like, let's get a ship. And like, that's where we see like Rocket Man, this other sea train. It's a beautiful contrast to the Puffing Tom. Rocket Man's like the Battle Frankie version of the sea train. Like this sea train will actually kill you. There aren't any brakes. You can hardly steer it. It goes as fast as it wants. But again, the worse things get, the better it is for them. This is like the thing that they need right now. And despite seeing the overwhelming size and destruction of Aqua Laguna, they are the most determined they possibly can be to go get Robin back. This is like the payoff to all of the interconnecting webs during this arc. Despite how bad everything has gone, this is the part where like Sanji boards the train, Luffy tells him, go nuts in there. We're like a little bit behind and we're coming over there. And so for this brief uh, final moment, we get to see the awkward reunion that is Sanji meeting Usopp and Frankie. This like really unexpected character dynamic where Sanji and Frankie just straight up hate each other. We get to see like the boiled hatred of Sanji along with like the very awkward situation that Usopp is in. When you get kidnapped, right? When you get kidnapped, you really don't want your prior crewmate who you're not on a good footing with to come and save you because I think that creates some awkward tension. Also, as a small side tangent, we should talk about the Sniper King, totally unrelated to any other character in the story. But I wanted to talk about how it relates to Usopp, hypothetically, if it was Usopp, not that it is. But I find it interesting that if it was Usopp, how Usopp essentially denies themselves the ability to help Robin as they're no longer a part of their crew and to Usopp's outer perspective, have no reason for saving him. 
and yet turns around as the Sniper King and is willing to help out if they are able to not take any of the credit for it as Usopp. Like, just from a psychological perspective, there's, like, a layer of shame that hides one's ability to accept, like, their role in helping here to the point where they have to deny themselves that ability by masquerading themselves as somebody else. Hypothetically, even though they were way underleveled here and they ultimately didn't end up succeeding, it's really interesting how much Usopp really tried in this moment. I mean, Sniper King. And so, you know, for the last story thread, I think we can connect Frankie and Mr. Tom to Robin as Frankie tells Robin this, like, out of nowhere, extremely sentimental phrase. It's not a crime to exist. This thing that, like, Mr. Tom has been, like, saying this whole time, puff out your chest, be proud of who you are. It's not a crime to just exist. And that's where the arc just like ends itself on the cliffhanger for Anna's lobby. After just like fully connecting all of those dots, now showing like what's at stake. We've laid all of the groundwork here in Water 7 to show like exactly what's at stake in Anna's lobby. It is one of the most interconnected arcs so far. And I'm just excited to hopefully get around to talking about Anna's lobby. I think this one has taken like the longest out of any to do, in part because these arcs are getting a lot longer. So hopefully you enjoyed it. I guess I should mention that I started a Patreon. I've had it for a little bit, and right now it's just a tip jar. The only problem is that I like the idea that if I'm going to do anything, I'd rather just make it public instead of like making special content locked behind anything. But I don't know, I'm still just experimenting with it. Also, shout out to Royce for being like the first member. <laughs> That's how I'm gonna end it. That's how I'm gonna end it.